Good evening. I'm very happy to be here and uh, thanks to the Congress for inviting me and to uh, all the great folks at Savas Beatty for arranging things. I'd like to tell you a story about a manuscript. It's an unassuming lined notebook sold in Boston by George B. Brown and Company stationers sometime between 1869 and 1872 when they operated out of a building at 94 State Street in Boston. The manuscript and a companion notebook that has seen more wear and ha handling were handed down from its own original owner through at least two generations of descendants until they wound up in the hands of Janine Hanstein, an artist living in Princeton, New Jersey. Her father told Janine that the manuscripts had been written by the father of his adopted mother, whom he called Auntie. That man, Janine's adoptive great-grandfather, was named William Francis Oscar Federer, and Janine wanted to know more about him and his manuscript. Fortunately, she lived across the street from the head librarian at Princeton University, Ann Jarvis. And Ann Jarvis, being my boss's boss's boss, told Janine that I might be able to help. The story of the manuscript is interesting enough, and we'll get to that shortly. But the story within the manuscript was truly fascinating. In his own beautiful handwriting, Federin recounted his experiences as a soldier in the Civil War from his enlistment to his encounter with the enemy and subsequent imprisonment, his numerous attempts to escape, his travels across North Texas in the final year of the war, and finally his reunion with his unit. It's a wild story that seems almost too fanciful to be true. So Janine and I wanted to check it against the historical record and see how much of his story can be verified. And the answer is almost all of it. Once we learned that, we wanted to share his story with the public. And we're very pleased that Savas Beatty decided to adopt Oscar's memoir for publication. We contributed some front matter regarding the origins around the text and Oscar's life, annotated the text and added illustrations and maps. It came out in early August as part of Savas Beatty's new Battles and Leaders series. This series is aimed at presenting shorter manuscripts that focus on less well-known theaters of the Civil War, in this case, the Trans-Mississippi. The books themselves are laid out to recall 19th century printing using typefaces reminiscent of Victorian presses and heavy paper stock with a matte finish on the dust jacket. It's a really beautiful artifact. And we're so flattered that Savas Beatty chose to present Oscar's story in an elegant volume. So this evening, I'd like to share with you a little bit about the manuscript, a little bit about Oscar Federin, a little bit about his service, and a little about his memoir. I hope you'll agree that he was a remarkable man with a fascinating story. Let's start with the manuscript. As I mentioned, there are two copies. The first one has a few clues about its origin. As I mentioned, we know it must have been purchased between 1869 and 1872 because that's when Brown and Company did business on State Street. But there's reason to, to believe the story was written or at least completed some years later. At the very end of the text, which stops short of Federer's return to Union lines, he copied out an article on the Sack of Lawrence by the noted guerrilla Quantrill, written by Major John Edwards of Missouri, an ex-Confederate. This article appeared in a newspaper from Salina, Kansas on March 8, 1877. Presuming the article was copied shortly after it was published, we can state that the first draft of the manuscript was written between 1869 and 1877. It included two drawings by Federin, as well as his text. The second draft of the manuscript can't be dated in the same way, as the notebook doesn't contain any seller's marks and the text is all Federin's own. We presume it's a second draft because of a number of small changes to the grammar and wording, and the narrative tells the complete story of Federin's service. It seems that Federin or someone else made extensive use of this second manuscript because the covers of the notebook show a considerable amount of wear and tear, and the ink is faded, uh, presumably from uh, being exposed to the light more. I think it's worth discussing the quality of Oscar's writing. 
in preparation for this talk, I read quite a few others' prisoners' memoirs, and I can testify that plenty of them are as dry as the dust that covers them in many libraries. There's a certain Victorian style that, when combined with military dryness, tends to suck all the excitement out of even the most adventuresome exploits, but not so for Oscar Federer. As you'll hear, his writing has vigor, color, and panache. He also knows how to structure his writing to keep the reader hanging in suspense. If I had to guess, I would think his tastes in reading ran toward dime novels. Family lore says that when Federin died in 1933, he passed the two manuscripts to his daughter Lizzie. Lizzie died in 1951, leaving the manuscripts to her son. The son forgot about them until 2015 when he mentioned them to his daughter Janine Hanstein. When Janine learned of them, she began the research process that led to the publication of Oscar's memoir. As for Oscar Federin himself, some of the facts of his life were easy to ascertain, but not everything. His birth date, for example, has proved elusive. His birth is not recorded in the vital records of Boston, his hometown. When he enlisted in the Union Army in 1864, he stated that he was born on September 17, 1844. But when he married on the first day of 1867, he stated that he was 21 years old, implying a birth date of 1845. His gravestone says that he was born in 1843. I have a suspicion that he was born in 1845 or 1846, based on other facts of his family's history. Oscar was the fourth child of six in his family. The third child, named William Francis Federin, died from croup in 1845 at the age of four. My guess is that when the next child was born, he was named William Francis after his deceased brother with Oscar added to distinguish him. We know little about Oscar's youth. His father, a jeweler, died in 1860 when Oscar was a young teen. His five or six years older brother, Jacob, enlisted in the first Massachusetts Light Artillery on April 20th, 1861 only five days after President Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers to suppress the rebellion. Jacob rose through the ranks to first lieutenant and was shot through both legs at the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse. During this period, Oscar worked as a brass finisher as he reported his occupation at the time of enlistment. Of Oscar's own military career, we can specify some facts beyond what he states in his memoir. He appears on a list of men subject to the draft that was compiled in May or June of 1863. In his memoir, he states that he was engaged in some affair, the negligence of which would have utterly ruined me. But after it was concluded, he enlisted in the 13th Massachusetts Light Artillery on March 25th, 1864. In this matter, his memoir and military records agree. Other records show that he was captured by the enemy while en route to his battery on May 3rd, 1864, and that he escaped from the enemy on June 3rd, 1865. He was mustered out of service on July 28th, 1865, and applied for a military pension in 1892. He was an active member of the Grand Army of the Republic, the Union Veterans Organization. After the war, he married and had a son and daughter. He divided his time between Boston and Salina, Kansas, where his brother and father-in-law lived, and he earned his living as a clerk or in sales. Oscar died in Chelsea, Massachusetts in 1933, aged around 87. Perhaps a brief word about his unit and the situation of the war in 1864 when Oscar enlisted will be helpful to contextualize his adventures. The 13th Massachusetts was a battery of light artillery. In the Civil War, artillery was classified as heavy or light. The heavy artillery served in permanent fortifications with very large guns unsuited to mobile warfare. Light artillery units, as the name implies, manned smaller guns that could be dr drawn by horses into battle. The thir 13th Massachusetts was an undistinguished unit, characterized by its superiors as lacking in martial vigor and competence. It was raised in the fall of 1862 and sailed to New Orleans in January of 1863. After a stormy voyage that killed a number of horses and destroyed equipment, it spent six weeks in port at Fortress Monroe in Virginia for refitting, 
and only arrived in New Orleans in May of 1863. During the summer of 1863, Union forces in the South were focused on breaking the Confederate hold on the Mississippi River. As forces from Memphis made their way south to Vicksburg, eventually seizing it on July 4th, troops from New Orleans marched north and besieged Port Hudson. That strong point, battered by the guns of the 13th, as well as many other units, fell on July 9th, and the Union had complete control of the Mississippi River. In the winter of 1863, the 13th Massachusetts participated in the unsuccessful campaign against Bayou Teche in western Louisiana. In the spring of 1864, as Oscar Federin was preparing to enlist in the service of the Union, the United States Armed Forces were readying a multi-pronged offensive. The intent of the overall Union commander, Ulysses S. Grant, was to attack Confederate forces from a number of directions simultaneously, so that pressure from numerous directions would force Confederate armies to fight in place rather than retreating or escaping. Lincoln compared it to a group of men dressing a slaughtered animal. Those not skinning can hold a leg. Union advances in the first three years of the war had reduced Confederate control of territory in the North Central Confederacy, but the secessionists retained all of Texas, the Deep South, and most of Virginia. Plans called for the commencement in May of five simultaneous offensives. The Army of the Potomac would march overland against the Confederates in Northern Virginia, while troops from the Department of West Virginia advanced south into the Shenandoah Valley, and the Army of the James attacked the outskirts of Richmond. Further south, the Army of Tennessee would advance toward Atlanta, and the Army of the Gulf would move toward Mobile. All of that would begin according to plan in May, except the advance toward Mobile. General Nathaniel P. Banks, former Speaker of the House of Representatives and a prominent advocate of Northern textile interests, added, advocated for a diversion in Louisiana prior to the scheduled May offensives. Banks thought that an advance up the Red River would allow for the installation of a pro-Union state government and the confiscation of hundreds of thousands of bales of cotton. Starting in March of 1864, Banks' troops, including the 13th Massachusetts, marched upriver accompanied by naval gunships. The Confederates constructed dams to lower the water level of the Red River and disabled the gunboats. Disloyal scouts double-crossed the Union Army and led them to march along a road with no fresh water and Confederate troops under General Richard Taylor put up a stout defense at the battles of Mansfield and Pleasant Hill on April 8th and 9th. A fighting retreat ended with a 13th Massachusetts encamped in Alexandria on May 3rd. It is there that Oscar Federin was bound when he was taken prisoner. The battery retreated to New Orleans in June of 1864 and spent the remainder of the war on garrison duty there. Now that we know something about the milieu in which Federin's story begins, we can talk about his story. After his enlistment in Boston in March 25th, Oscar spent just 12 days in a training camp before embarking on a 15-day voyage via steamer to New Orleans. As we have mentioned, his unit was already engaged in the Red River campaign, and he was joining as a replacement for some soldier who had likely been wounded or become ill. The 13th suffered almost no men killed in action. After four days in the Crescent City, he steamed north up the Mississippi to its confluence with the Red River, where he waited for a boat to come down from Alexandria and assure his group that the banks were free from guerrillas. On April 30th, he suffered his first misfortune of war. As he writes, a board was laid out for one of the officers to go on shore and five others in and myself improved the opportunity and went also. The captain cautioned us not to go too far because he expected to start any hour. We rambled about the country for an hour and a half when the boat blew the signal to come on board. We started on a run, but came too late. The steamer had gone and left us behind. On the evening of May 2nd, the steamer City Bell came past and was signaled. So on May 3rd, Oscar was on his way back to his, his unit in Alexandria. You may recall, however, that the original reason he was waiting was to be sure the banks of the Red River were clear of Confederates. Alas, he writes, about half past four in the afternoon, we made Snaky Point, 
and found the banks occupied by Confederate General Lane's division and some artillery. As soon as we hove in sight, we received the fire of their artillery, and one of the first shots went through our boilers, disabling the boat immediately. We had only infantry on board, and many of those got burned or otherwise injured by the escaping steam. So our resistance was but feeble, and after a half hour's fighting, the Johnnies came on board. Taken prisoner, Oscar found himself relieved of his revolver, his watch, his money, his knife, his comb, and as a final indignity, his new hat. He was left to be roasted in the southern sun by day, chilled to the very marrows by the heavy dews at night. Often for days without food, even water, without shelter, friendless, deserted, lonesome, alone, months of danger and peril, outrage and hardship. For the next 17 days, Oscar and the rest of the men captured from the city bell were marched west through Cheneyville to Grand Ecor. From there, they took a boat to Shreveport and marched on to Tyler, Texas. He recalls that you can imagine how sore and blistered my feet got, and yet it was sure death to lie down. I've seen men on the forced march give out from hunger and fatigue. They begged for only five minutes rest and received curses and blows in answer. If they could not go further and sank down in the road, the next passing rebel raised his musket and with the butt smashed out the brains of the unfortunate sufferer. It's interesting to note how the Southern accent fell on Federer's New England ear in the writing of his account. Clearly, he wrote without looking at a map because he rendered Snaggy Point as Snaky Point, Cheneyville as Janeyville, and Tyler as Taylor. Later on, he makes Bonham, Texas, into Barnum, the Bordark Creek into Bordark, and Borland into Boland. Tyler, Texas was the site of Camp Ford, the largest prisoner of war camp west of the Mississippi. In its three years of operation from 1862 to 1865, around 6,000 men passed through its gates, of whom about 5% died, a relatively small figure compared to the most notorious camps such as Andersonville. Nonetheless, there were severe shortages of food, shelter, and clothing, although the camp did have a fresh stream of water running nearby. Camp Ford was an open-air prison surrounded by a wooden stockade. Federer was held in Camp Ford for an indeterminate period. As he notes, a diary or a calendar is an article utterly unknown in prison, but I estimate it at about five months. He details the hunger, the disease, the boredom, and the tyranny of prison life in his memoir. One highlight was the time when he received a blouse, a shirt, a pair of shoes, and a blanket through the administrations of the United States Sanitary Commission. The Sanitary Commission was an institution unique to the Civil War. While not a branch of the government, it worked closely with commanders of both armies to provide medicine, clothing, and other necessities to maintain the health, comfort, and cleanliness of troops, whether in a friendly camp or a prison. Veterans' quarters are illustrated in his manuscript. After the first few months of living shelterless, the cold campground was our bed and a log of wood for our pillow to prevent our head from sinking into the soft ground. In August, a new commandant of Camp Ford allowed the prisoners to go into the nearby woods under guard, cut logs, and build huts. Oscar's hut was eight feet high and six by ten in width. I lived quite comfortable, for I let a part of my house to three New York soldiers. They were to cook my food and chop wood to pay the rent. The earth was banked upon one side of the cabin and answered for beds. We cooked, ate, and slept in this room. For amusement, the men sang, played dominoes, and dealt cards. The cards were made out of thin pieces of wood with their names and numbers burnt on them by means of a broken fork. There was also chess, checkers, and musical instruments such as tambourine, fiddle, and banjo. The drum heads of the tambourine and the banjo made from the skin of old cats. Still, disease stalked the camp. Veterans' fellow inmates suffered from measles, smallpox, fevers, chills, scurvy, and Satan's itch. The latter is an after-effect of sunburn that causes an excruciating, stabbing, deep itch that comes in fiery, unscratchable waves that consume one with panic. Veteran himself had scurvy and suffered from its effects on poor wound healing. 
any small bump or bruise would become an open sore and maggots would infest them. He boiled his clothes to kill the maggots. Now, in the early years of the war, being taken pr prisoner usually translated to a short confinement. The two armies regularly exchanged prisoners to relieve themselves of the duty of guarding them. However, in 1863, the Union Army began to enlist African-American soldiers into the United States Colored Troops. The Confederate Army would not recognize them as soldiers, but rather treated them as rebellious slaves and refused to return them to the Union Army. As a result, President Lincoln ordered that there would be no exchange of prisoners until the Confederate Army agreed to treat all Union soldiers on an equal basis. Although some prisoners did occur, and a few prisoners at Camp Ford were exchanged in January of 1865, Federan would likely have known that his imprisonment was to be for the duration of the war. Oscar became determined to escape from Camp Ford as soon as he arrived. His first attempt occurred in the late summer. He had become a skilled whittler, using his broken knife to fashion rings from broken bones, which he traded to fellow prisoners for tobacco. Using some of these articles, as well as the brass buttons from his uniform, plus his blanket and blouse, he bribed a guard to let him through the stockade. Oscar ran as far as he could until sunrise and rested under a tree. Within a half hour, he heard bloodhounds approaching. A quick shinny up the tree likely saved his life from the jaws of the hounds, but the guards who followed them took Federan prisoner and returned him to the prison. Federan witnessed a number of other escape attempts. One of the most notorious was the smuggling of prisoners in a dirt cart, which is literally the cart used to collect street sweepings, which in those cases, those days included horse droppings. When the cart was taken out of the camp, a smuggled prisoner would run for freedom. After the guards caught on to this practice, they made a habit of plunging a saber into the dirt cart before allowing it to leave camp. The prisoners thus wounded would cry out, revealing themselves. This story sounds ludicrous, but it is independently attested in the memoir of another Camp Ford prisoner, The Bright Side of Prison Life by S.A. Swiggett. Tunneling out of prison was also attempted, not only at Camp Ford, but at prison camps through the South. One famous prison break was a tunnel out of Libby Prison in Richmond that several dozen prisoners used to escape. Swiggett also wrote about tunneling attempts at Camp Ford. Federan was a part of a conspiracy of 20 men in four squads of five. One squad would dig half the night, another squad the rest of the night. They had nothing to dig with but an old common case knife and a piece of saber. The process was that the digger would fill a haversack with dirt and an assistant would pull it out using a rope made from uh, strips of a blanket. The other two men would carry it off and empty it in holes or bank it up against their houses. It was very tedious work for some nights we would not gain more than an inch. Federan's group watched other tunnelers fail for want of judgment. They would come out of their cabin in the morning after they had been at work with their clothes all covered with red clay. And as soon as Johnny Reb saw them, he knew well what they had been about and by that means they would get caught. Prisoners caught attempting faced no mercy. A common punishment was to be hanged by the thumbs an attempt to force a confession and implicate Cohn's conspirators. Federan's second attempt at escape occurred after the tunnel had reached about 130 feet long. All was dug except the final crust, which when broken through, would expose the tunnel to the free air outside the stockade. The man who had dug the final length was of a smaller stature than Federan. So when Oscar went to dig the last inch of dirt, he could not pull himself through the hole. In fact, the harder he worked, the more firmly he found himself wedged, five feet underground and about 120 from the entrance and running out of air. With a final effort, he was able to crawl back to the entrance, much to the surprise of his collaborators who expected that he had escaped already. The next day, Federin visited the camp doctor to ask for turpentine, claiming that he needed it as a salve for sore muscles. That night, he was on firewood gathering duty so he slipped a bite of food into his pocket and went into the woods with his crew and their two guards. Surreptitiously, he ventured farther from the guards on each trip into the woods until he was able to position himself behind a large tree blocking the guards' view of him and then began to run. Within a half hour, the bloodhounds baying began 
So he covered his feet with turpentine to throw them off his scent. Weakened by his disease, he could not go more than a half mile without having to lay down and rest. Luckily, he escaped their notice and was never to return to Camp Ford. He made one last rendezvous at the camp hospital where he knew of another man who wished to escape, a Kansas soldier named Rufus Custard. The hospital was lightly guarded and Custard slipped out the window along with two other men named Edwin Wallace and Joseph Brown. Wallace and Brown said they were from Western Texas and proposed that the party travel to their homes. Although that route would take Custard and Federer farther from Union lines, they agreed. Something interesting here occurs in the historical record. Rufus Custard is easily attested in census records. He lived in Bourbon County, Kansas from the 1850s until his death in 1884. But I can't find anyone named Edwin Wallace or Joseph Brown who were Union soldiers from Texas. There were only a few Union units from Texas. But another possibility arises. It was not unknown for Confederate deserters to wind up enlisted in the Union Army and then be taken prisoner again by Confederates. Federer describes the horrible treatment inflicted on such men by the guards at Camp Ford. So it just may be that Wallace and Brown were not Union soldiers, but rather Confederate deserters. As for why they would want Federer and Custard to accompany them to Western Texas, well, more company makes for an easier trip. And having a couple of escaped Union prisoners on hand could provide a bargaining kit should trouble with Confederate authorities arise. The group, group's first destination was Sherman, Texas, about 130 miles west of Camp Ford, where Wallace had his home. The um, Northerners, Custard and Federer, hoped to uh, gather some supplies there and then make their way north. They walked through at, by night through woods and swamps, avoiding houses and eating the natural foods found in the woods, such as sassafras root. The fresh air and vitamin C improved veteran, veterans' health. At times, when desperate hunger forced them to approach a house, they posed as Confederate soldiers hunting for escaped prisoners. At one point, Wallace and Brown gave them the slip, and Custard and Federan were forced to travel by themselves. They persisted in going west in the hopes of catching up to Wallace and securing provisions. At several points on the trip to Sherman, Federan and Custard encountered civilians and their interactions reveal the poverty that had settled on Texas in the last year of the war. There was seldom any food other than cornmeal to eat. Men of all ages were gone to the front, and fuel for the fires was used sparingly. There was a narrow escape when they ran into mounted Confederates. They quickly concocted a story that Federer and Custard were Confederate soldiers trying to get to Mexico. They were let off with a warning to bring plenty of water for the desert crossing. In Sherman, they found Wallace's family and discovered that Wallace was under suspicion as a spy and the house was being watched by the Home Guard, a volunteer militia used for local defense. Custard soon walked away without saying farewell, leaving Federer all alone, a federal soldier trapped deep in Texas. Several times, Federer approached homes to ask for food or shelter. He was often begrudgingly offered succor, but the residents reported a fear of being discovered with a Union soldier in their homes. The wrath of the Confederate militia would be meted out not only to Federer, but to those who sheltered him. By this time, it seems to have been midwinter around the turn of 1864 to 1865. The nights were cold and rain was frequent. Federer left Sherman and made his way in a northwesterly direction with the hope of making his way to Kansas, which he reckoned as the nearest friendly territory. Numerous hazards made his journey miserable, from swollen rivers that could only be crossed by floating on a log, to angry householders, including a large hound who greeted me with a growl, which sounded to me as it came through his ivory teeth that he knew that I was a Yankee and he wanted me to look sharp. After numerous near misses, he finally approached the wrong house one headed by a Confederate officer. The officer held Federer at gunpoint and sent for the nearest soldiers. Troops from Borland's regiment, which patrolled the northern tier of counties in Texas, came and took him to Gainesville for judgment by Colonel James G. Borland, notorious for his hanging of more than 40 suspected Union sympathizers in 1862. 
In his text, Federn even names the lieutenant, L.D. Green, who, took, who led the squadron that took him in. Green's name appears on the roster of Company C of Borland's regiment. After three days of walking and riding under guard, Oscar was brought to Gainesville, the headquarters of Colonel Borland. Borland had him confined in a municipal jail about a quarter mile from headquarters. The cell was dark, only eight feet in square and dug five feet into the ground. Sitting in the dark, contemplating his fate, Federin made up my mind to escape. For I'd rather run my chance in being shot than be starved to death by these fellows who now call themselves honest and loyal men. There was a short ladder which afforded means to get up from the hole to the door. So I got up and sat on the upper rung of this so that I might hear the conversation of the guards. They had a great deal to say about poor Yank, and he understood from the sergeant they were going to hang him in the morning. Veteran called to a guard and asked to be allowed to walk on the green. Feigning more weakness than he felt, Oscar slowly climbed his ladder and processed to the green with slow, tender steps. After about six yards, the guards told him he had gone far enough. <laughs> He remembered they were both leaning on their guns facing toward me. This was and perhaps would be my only chance of escape, although it might prove fatal. As soon as they told me to stop, I began to fuss with my pants, keeping my eyes fixed on them to watch every movement that I might make the best of it. They were busy talking to each other when I stooped and as I stooped, I started and ran toward the woods, which is about a quarter of a mile distant. I had not run more than a dozen steps before the guard hallowed me to stop and at the same time discharging their rifles at me. Oscar ran as fast as he could, changing course westward once inside the woods to fool any pursuers. After a day and a night of running, he lay down to rest. Hearing whistling in the distance, he discovered that two enslaved men were coming down the road. They offered him some cornbread and in the ensuing conversation, he learned that they had been enslaved by the very Confederate officer who had captured Federer the day before. They pointed him in the direction of federal lines and went on their way. This incident brings up an interesting point. Despite traveling through Louisiana and Texas, Federer only mentions encountering African-Americans a few times in his narrative. His Louisiana days are only briefly mentioned, but he discourses about Texas at length. One explanation for his few mentions of African-Americans is likely that simply he seldom met any. In the 1860s, the northern counties of Texas had a population that was less than 10% African American, and many of them would have been on the plantations where Federer never dared to venture. Following his escape from Gainesville, Federer set out across the open prairie. There was no sign of any settlement, and the road had not been traveled over for the grass grew in it as green as the prairie. Thinking it perfectly safe now to travel in the day, I kept on stopping to rest occasionally and to eat from my scanty rations, for they were fast diminishing. I came to a turn in the road, and as I turned the road, there stood about a dozen men chatting and having a good time. Perhaps, thought I, it might be some of Colonel Borland's scouts, so I turned to go back. At the same instant, one of the men sung out for me to halt, but instead of halting, I started and ran toward the brush. He shouted for me to halt again, answered by the shot of a musket the ball of which sent a very unpleasant breeze past my head and lodged in a tree in front of me. These men, it turns out, were scouts from General Henry McCulloch, who commanded the northern subdistrict of Texas. They took him by wagon to Bonham and locked him in a small room under suspicion of being a spy from the Union forces operating in the Indian Territory just north of Bonham. A transfer to a log cabin just outside, a mile outside of Bonham, put Oscar into confinement with another man who called himself Bill Grandstaff. Grandstaff claimed to be part of a band of irregular soldiers called Quantrill's Raiders. A brief word about Quantrill's Raiders is in order here. William Quantrill was a Missourian who organized a group of bandits. In addition to theft and murder of defenseless households along the frontier, the raiders also attacked Union troops. In 1862 and 1863, Quantrill's raiders fought in Missouri and Kansas. They famously raided Lawrence, Kansas in 1863 and killed more than 150 civilians. Following that, they moved south and wintered over near Sherman, Texas. They caused so much havoc there that 
General Henry McCulloch ordered them to Corpus Christi. However, Quantrill refused the order, and in early 1864, the raiders split into two groups who raided Missouri and were eventually defeated in battle by Union troops. There was no organized remnant of Quantrill's raiders in Texas during 1865. For the next part of Federer's memoir, he reports being closely associated with Quantrill's raiders in Texas in the spring of 1865. This is not concordant with the historical record and leads me to believe one of two possibilities. The first is that Federer is embellishing his story. The second is that he encountered some group of ruffians. They may have adopted the name of Quantrill's raiders in a time and place where much confusion about events elsewhere existed. It seems impossible to know definitively what happened. Anyway, Federin was in jail with Bill Grandstaff, who claimed to be one of Quantrill's raiders. Interestingly, there was a Bill Grandstaff who was 19 years old in 1865 and was born in the part of Missouri where Quantrill recruited his men. But in 1865, there were no raiders left in Texas. After 10 days in the Bonham jail, Oscar and Bill conspired to make their escape. One evening, Federin stood in the doorway talking with a guard. Grandstaff struck the guard with a heavy piece of wood, knocking him to the ground. Both prisoners ran out the door and into the brush. Another night of frantic travel led them toward the Red River. Crossing it on a makeshift log raft, the two escapees walked another day and night until they came to a camp. Federin claims the camp was Quantro's raiders. He says he met Bloody Bill Anderson, the most notorious of Quantrill's officers, even though Anderson died in 1864. Federin recounts a six-week sojourn with Quantrill's raiders, claiming he joined in three raids, each more vicious than the last. Chickens were stolen, old men were tortured, residents were murdered. Whether there's any truth to Federin's stories of Quantrill's raiders, the rest of his time in Texas is adventure enough. Seeking federal lines again, he voluntarily departed Quantrill's camp and made his way eastward, staying near the Red River. He again encountered Confederate scouts and was returned to Henry McCulloch, to General McCulloch at Bonham. As soon as the old general saw me, he exclaimed, what, you brought that cussed Yankee back again? This time he was taken to a blacksmith and fitted for leg irons. He took four half round pieces of iron and riveted them together so they made two rings. Then he took a bar of iron about 18 inches long and fastened the ring onto each end of it, then riveted to the rings around my ankles. He then took a chain about two feet long and fastened it in the center of this bar and attached it to the end of the chain with a 20 pound ball. I asked the officer if there was not anything else he could put on my foot. In the guardhouse, he met a fellow prisoner. He did not look like a Southern or Western man. His manner and talk showed that he had a good education and the thought passed through my mind that it was, he was an Eastern man. Upon further conversation, Federin learned that he was a doctor from Philadelphia and had been a student of Federin's uncle, who was also a doctor in that city. Historical city directories show a Dr. Silas Brooks in Philadelphia. Federin's mother was named Elizabeth Brooks. This may have been the physician in question. After a week, the irons began to tear the flesh off of Oscar's ankles. Dr. Upshaw treated him with cold compresses and in the course of treatment surreptitiously spread one of the links of the chain. In addition, the application of soap allowed Federin to slip the ring off his foot, but then he had to lay in bed under blankets so the guards would not learn that he was out of his irons. However, the other foot still had a ring on it. Veteran's final escape came when a group of 20 prisoners stormed out of the guardhouse door, overwhelming the men on duty. The exterior fence had to be torn down by brute force, but the escapees managed it and all scattered in different directions. Two prisoners lived locally and guided Veteran toward the Bois d'Arc river bottom, where they crossed to an island heavily overgrown with brush. Resting there, they evaded the scouts. A file and provisions were brought by the locals, and Federin was finally relieved of his irons. One more overland trip lay ahead for Oscar. Making his way to Shreveport, he posed as a Confederate courier and passed a group headed to Bonham to see the hanging of several prisoners who had escaped and been caught. 
Although Federin had perhaps thought that Shreveport would have fallen to Union forces, it was the initial target of the River Campaign a year before. It remained a Confederate stronghold until May 20th and was not taken over by Union troops until June 6th. In the interim, order was maintained by a unit of Confederate soldiers that refused to retreat when their commander, Edward Edmund Kirby Smith, took the main body of his forces out of town. It was on May 30th that Federin approached the outskirts of town. I stayed there all night and in the morning I washed myself, brushed my clothes and so to look as respectable as possible, threw my blanket over my shoulder and started toward the city. I met a great many rebel soldiers, but they all minded their own business and I kept on into the city and I looked as much like a reb as any of them. He learned that a ship named La Fourche was departing Shreveport to meet the federal fleet downriver. Contemporary newspaper accounts show that the Lafourche left Shreveport on May 31st with a large number of refugees on their way home and docked in New Orleans on June 6th. Federer notes that it sailed under the Confederate flag. Federer sneaked on board, posing as a stevedore, and stowed away behind a woodpile. After the first night on the river, Oscar noted, there was a great many Confederate soldiers on board going down to the river to meet the Yanks and get their parole, meaning a release from Confederate duty after surrendering to Union forces. They all looked the same as myself. I knew, I knew that all on board had paid their fares, and I was determined to go on deck before morning. Midnight came, there was quite a number walking on deck. Some were singing, others were talking and laughing, and a few laying asleep about the deck. After another day, the Lafourche hauled down their Confederate flags and raised the flag of truce. The next Union gunboat they met told them they were five miles above Alexandria. I thought this was the best news I had ever heard. I went and sat on the bow of the boat so that I might be one of the first to see the Yankees. The engine put on more steam so that the boat might go faster, and I was watching more eagerly for the Stars and Stripes. Every time the boat rounded a bend, I could imagine I could see my native flag. It was not much more than an hour before we came in sight of the fleet. And forgetting myself and where I was, I jumped up, clapping my hands and shouting three cheers for the American flag. I had no more than got the words out of my mouth before I received a kick, followed by the remarks that if it did that again, they would drown me. As the Lafourche approached the Union fleet and were told to lay by, Oscar jumped off the boat aiming for the shore, but landed in the water instead. Climbing out of the river, he spoke to the nearest Union officer and was sent to the headquarters boat of General Francis Heron, commander of the Northern District of Louisiana. The general wanted to know who I was and if I was a federal soldier, where and what did I belong to? Well, he might ask those questions, for I looked worse than any reb. My clothes were torn and full of dirt and vermin, for they had not been off for about four weeks. My hair had grown wild and hung in a tangled mass over my shoulders. My face was covered with fine beard and dirt, and my complexion was dark from exposure. No flesh on my bones, and my eyes settled in my head. I was a picture of what you might call a living skeleton. Provided with a haircut, shave, and new clothes, Federin then had his fellow Union soldiers pull the ticks out of his back. Apparently in those days, ticks were unknown to Bostonians, for he ventures an explanation of them to his readers. In the first week of June, Federin disembarked at New Orleans. He was guided to the camp of the 13th Massachusetts Light Artillery and reunited with his unit. Although he had been actively engaged with the enemy for more than a year, Federer never saw a moment of combat alongside the men of the 13th. On June 14, 1865, Oscar Federer and the 13th Massachusetts sailed for home. A week later, they landed in Massachusetts. As soon as we landed in Boston, we were put under guard for they were forming the battery into line. I gave them the slip and ran for home. I found my mother in the kitchen, and when I opened the door, she stood looking at me in wonder and astonishment, for I did not look as much as I did when I left home. I was pale and thin. I was heartily welcomed home, and soon I sat down to a good table with hot biscuit and Yankee coffee, prepared by a dear mother who had surrendered both her sons to the altar of liberty and had strove hard to do all she could for the soldier's comfort. Despite his temporary absence without leave, Oscar was mustered out of the Union Army on June 28th. 
I hope you've enjoyed this taste of 13 months in Dixie. There are many more tales, reminiscences, and os examples of Oscar's witty prose. We're very pleased and proud to have brought this fa fascinating memoir to your attention, and I think it adds a lot to our understanding of the Civil War in Texas. And uh, the book is available from Savas Beatty. You can order it direct from their website. Um, there's a, a long link here, but if you just go to SavasBeatty.com and search for 13 months in Dixie, you'll find the um, page that allows you to order the book. Thanks very much for your attention this evening. It's been a great pleasure to be here with you.